Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Adult Sunday School. Before we pray, let me just flip through some of these preliminary um, slides. So we're back to practical themes for the uh, book of Proverbs. For those of you that are new, these are the four topics that we rotate. Um, we haven't been on church history for a while because Pastor Smith's been doing the new members class, but we rotate these four topics from week to week. And for the Proverbs series, these are the topics we've covered thus far. And today, um, I didn't know whether to call it humble, lowly, or meek, so I just called it all three. Uh, meek, lowly, and humble, uh, which is found in the Proverbs. And then I wanted to give credit to these guys. I, I think I do mention when I quote them, but I lead heavily upon them, changing some of their sentence structure and so forth. So I wanted to give them credit. And this is um, going to be our outline today. So with that said, let's, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to be alive in this world, and to be able to gather together and to worship you, our gracious Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We do pray that the Holy Spirit would bless all of our activities today, our Sunday school, our worship, our Lord's Supper, and our fellowship meal. We just pray that you would bless it for your glory and for our good. Please be with all the Sunday school teachers and the students today. Please work in their hearts for your glory and for their salvation. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at meek, lowly, and humble, explained, exemplified, and exercised. So first, let's consider meek, lowly, and humble, explained. <clears throat> for a few minutes... We're going to consider Proverbs 3.34. Surely he scorns the scornful, but he gives grace to the humble. Notice first the clarity and the certainty of the who and the how. The who is God and the how is surely. This pithy proverb has no evasion, no vagueness. He is the Lord God Almighty. Surely he scorns the scornful. No doubt at all. No doubt whatsoever. You can bank on it. God does not lie. God cannot lie. Interestingly, this verse is quoted twice by two different New Testament authors. Once by James, the brother of Jesus, who's the author of the book of James, and once by Peter, the apostle, who was very close to our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Greek New Testament, the translation of the Hebrew words from Proverbs 3.34 is a little different, but the meaning is the same. In James 4.6 and 1 Peter 5.5, 5, we read, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is the same verse in Hebrews 3.34, but it's been translated from the Hebrew into the Greek, as opposed to the Hebrew into the English. Hebrew into the Greek and then into the English. Scorners in Scripture are proud, wicked men. For God to resist such persons is the equivalent of scorning them. It is important to note that Proverbs 3.34 is not just contrasting a good thing versus a bad thing. Again, notice the pronoun he in the verse. Our God is a personal being. He's the maker of heaven and earth. He created you. He created me for himself, for his glory. He is a jealous God, the Bible teaches. His heart his divine will delights in his dear children found in Christ Jesus. He gives grace to the humble, but this personal being also scorns the scornful. He scoffs at the scoffer. He resists the proud. He hates the wicked. 
Scorn or scoff means to mock another, to laugh at, to reject, to resist, to show no respect for. This is exactly what Satan did when he lured Eve into sin in the garden. He mocked and laughed at God. He rejected God as he deceived and tempted Eve to mock him as well. Did God indeed say, did God indeed say you, that if you bite that fruit, you'll surely die? <laughs> oh, my dear Eve, you need to get a clue, girl. You must, you must protect yourself from him. He's not giving to you. He's not giving you the whole picture here. He's keeping the truth from you. You're losing out big time, sister. You're going to miss out on so much knowledge, on so much pleasure, so much independence, so much self-control. If you submit to his authority, if you embrace his will, it will be so harmful to you and to your future in this wonderful world. He's going to hold you back so much, so many things you'll not be able to enjoy and experience. In this first chapter of Proverbs, wisdom, earlier in the first chapter of Proverbs, wisdom, or we can say Christ, speaks, raising his voice to the simple ones, saying, How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke, says wisdom, says Jesus. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out, there's that word surely again. Surely. I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make words known to you. Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel. And you would have none of my rebuke. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, God is not playing around here. He has already done what he has said he will do. And each succeeding generation has a choice to make, receive his grace through humility or suffer his scorn. Think of the people of Noah's day who mocked Noah and mocked Noah's God. Or the people of Sodom and Gomorrah practicing exceeding evil, men with men. Or the makers of the Tower of Babel, scorning the Almighty by grasping at divinity, motivated by the same wicked rebellion as Adam and Eve, wanting independence from God, wanting to be their own gods. Or men like Pharaoh, who mocked the God of Moses time and time again. We have, a, we have a tendency to classify these as great scorners of God, whom God resisted. He scorns the scornful. But God always has the last word. For Adam and Eve, their hearts were darkened, becoming slaves to sin. For the people of Noah's day, they all perished in a flood. They too were mocked by God. For the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he laughed at them with a holy justice, Quote, the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord did that. Your God did that. For the proud ones of Babel, uniting to build that tower in rebellion against God, they were also scorned by God. He forced them to scatter over all the face of the earth in confusion from supernatural verbal division. Listen to Psalm 2. Listen to Psalm 2. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Derision means to make a mockery of, to scorn or ridicule. God resists the proud. He rejects the rejecter. Listen to Psalm 37, verses 12 and 13. The wicked plots un against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. But the Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. You see, God sees your future days. He knows you reject him now, and he will reject you later. As he does for all who have ever scorned and mocked the Lord. 
God's rejection of the wicked scorner is necessary. His holy being cannot abide sin. God is a holy personal being. We're not dealing here with generic moral ethics of good and evil. We're dealing with our God, the Lord, and his enemy, Satan, the prince of darkness. God put hostility between his seed and the devil's seed, between her seed and his seed. Every one of us in this room is on one side or the other, light or darkness, God or Satan. Something so very, very sobering, so very sad that makes the people of God weep and cry out in prayer, pleading day after day, are those of you in this very room who have heard and listened to the good news of the love of Jesus Christ from childhood. Now, I might only be speaking to one person in this room, but let me, let me speak to them. For so long you've known of Jesus Christ's death on the cross, of his resurrection from the dead, of his healing of the sick. You know of his loving invitation, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know of how he wept and prayed for those who nailed him to the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The sad fact of the matter is that in some ways you are more hateful to God than the Sodomites and the mockers of Noah and Noah's day. Because you've heard the good news of Jesus Christ, the Savior, for so many years. You've been bathed in the gospel from childhood and yet you will not submit to his righteousness. You rather listen to the devil and your own sinful heart than listen to God. Has your heart become this hard? That you're you're the one that scorns the cornerstone of salvation. You scorn Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. You scorn the bleeding savior who came to die for sinners, to save sinners. If you die in your sins, God will mock you for rejecting his love, for rejecting his only begotten son who died for rebels just like you. But, but he gives grace to the humble. The man or woman, boy or girl who is humble, lowly and meek is the one given grace by the living God. The word grace, what is it? What is grace? It's his compassion. It's his kindness. It's his favor. It's the opposite of his scorn. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. What does humble mean? To be humble is being lowly in spirit, not on a high horse, looking down upon other people. It's being needy, not full of self-sufficiency, but knowing that you're in need of God. The humble find their sufficiency in God. To be meek, lowly, and humble implies a lack of resources, a deficiency in you, so that you are bowed down before God and gentle with others, not arrogant, not prideful, but poor and afflicted and unpretentious, modest and unassuming. Humility is meekness, not not being prideful, not being self-sufficient. Meekness or humility is a supernatural work of God in the soul. It's not an easy grace. It comes by suffering. It comes by crying after it. It comes by dying to self. It comes by faith and repentance. In James 4, 9, it says this. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he, he will lift you up. The meek and the humble are submissive to the divine will, patient and gentle with others, self-controlled, not easily irritated and provoked, forbearing under injuries and annoyances. 
The humble are courteous and kind. I think of Daniel. Meekness is not cultivated and produced merely through natural training and human effort. Meekness requires spiritual revolution. The old must die so that the new may live. Meekness is formed within a person by the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works through God's word. By nature, all of us are selfish and demand our own rights. By nature, we're resentful. Like wild animals, when strike, struck, we strike back. When wronged, we demand our rights and we look for repayment. We become bitter when someone is unkind to us. We hold grudges when people do us wrong. Char Charles Bridges comments, a lowly spirit displays a deep conviction of one's own nothingness and guilt. Do you ever look in the mirror and say, there's, there's a lot of nothingness right there and a lot of guilt. That's what the low and the humbly do, humble do. Not merely occasionally or temporarily, but it's a habitual principle. As Peter writes, be clothed with humility from the sole of your foot to the top of your heads. We're, we're to be fully humble, fully clothed with it. This humility combines, and this is um, Bridges talking, this humility combines the highest elevation of joy with the deepest abasement of spirit. It's basically knowing who God is and knowing who we are. Those who sink the lowest stand the nearest to the most exalted advancement, says Bridges. For he that scorneth the scorners also gives grace to the lowly. And James 4 says, more grace till his work is perfected in them. He pours his grace upon humble hearts. The soul filled with its own pride has no room for this humbling grace. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. It's a beautiful promise, isn't it? That he may exalt you, the, the God of the universe. Now that we've considered an explanation of the meek, lowly, and humble from Proverbs 3.34, we turn, to our ten, our, turn our attention to a few biblical examples of those who were meek, lowly, and humble. I'd like us to look at three examples. First, the penitent. Some versions call her the sinful woman. And then the publican or the tax collector. And then we want to look at our Lord Jesus Christ. So first, in Luke chapter 7, I don't have the verse up here. If you want to follow along, you can, but I'll read it. It's only 14 verses. A sinful woman forgiven. Uh, Luke seven thirty six. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. Now, let me just stop there for a minute. I don't know about you, but I, I, don't, I don't just walk into people's homes. Do you ever do that? Just walking down the street, you're like, oh, I think someone in there that I know. I'm just going to walk into their house. Here's a sinful woman of that society walking into a Pharisee's house. Why would she do that? We know why, right? Jesus was in there. <clears throat> she brings the alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him. And she began to wash his feet with her tears. So here she is weeping. She's crying. It's not a put on. She's not like, oh, let me force out some tears. She really is weeping and they're falling on his feet. And she wipes her tears with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now here's Jesus having, ready to have a religious talk with a Pharisee. And this sinner woman is weeping on his feet. 
Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. (laughs) He says, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him, for she's a sinner. He can't be a prophet. He's letting her touch him and weep on him. What kind of prop, what kind of holy man would allow that? He's not a prophet. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who was forgiven more. And he, capital H, said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman, he turned to the sinner and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair from her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This woman who was a sinner is a good example for someone lowly in spirit. She's not self-sufficient. She's not self-righteous like the Pharisee. She's needy. She knows her need of Christ. And she depends upon Christ for forgiveness. And having found him full of grace toward her, she worships and serves him freely, uninhibitedly. Like Pastor Smith said the other, the other night, not not keeping a checklist. The Pharisee, on the other hand, is on his high horse looking down upon this sinful woman. The home, the homeowner is self-righteous, a formalist. Jesus, in a just and principled manner, wisely resists the proud. He resists the proud scorner And he gives grace to the humble, honest, penitent, sinful woman. What a beautiful story of our God. The God who will scorn the scorner and laugh at their derision is the same God that shows mercy to this sinful woman because she was humble. Let's move to the the publican in chapter 18, Luke 18, 9 through 14. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Aren't aren't I so good? Those are good things. Those are good things. But God already knows. He doesn't need you to tell him in your prayers. And the tax collector, and tax collectors back then were known for adultery, were known for wasting money, stealing, embezzling. The tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified 
rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Isn't that strange? There's a whole mass of religious people that think they're on their way to heaven because they're good and they tithe and they go to church. And then there's a whole mass of wicked people, of tax collectors and prostitutes who think they'll never have a chance to go to heaven. They're on their way to hell and they know it. But in reality, these people, if they just turn in humility, are on their way to heaven justified. And these people full of self-righteousness who would never be humble like them are on their way to hell. Because Jesus wants all the glory. You can't get to heaven by your good works, trusting in your own good works. Meek, lowly, and humble is this tax collector who would not so much as even raise his eyes to heaven as he cried out to God, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And did you notice the Pharisee talking to God about me, myself, and I? I thank you that I am not like the other. I fast, I tithe. Jesus reminds us that humble, that, that humble sinner that tax collector is the one that went down to his house justified. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Charles Spurgeon has a wonderful quote, and it's good for us respectable people that have been church members since, for me, since 1983. It's good for us to be reminded Charles Spurgeon shows us an example of what meek, lowly, and humble looks like in the life of a true Christian. He says, if you're to go to Christ, do not put on your good doings and feelings, or you will get nothing. Go in your sins. They are your livery or your clothing. Your ruin is your argument for mercy. I love that. Your poverty is your plea for heavenly alms. Heavenly contribution back to you. And your need is the motive for heavenly goodness. Go as you are and let your miseries plead for you. What kind of God do we have that is so merciful, so gracious, so loving that he says sinners come? Spurgeon wants us to see the love and mercy of our gracious father and our Lord Jesus Christ who bled and died for you. Come as you are. He's your heavenly father. He loves you like, like the father in the prodigal story. He runs to you and kisses your neck and rejoices that the sinner has come home. Beautiful. Let's consider, let's consider Jesus. Let's consider Jesus under three headings, also who exemplified uh, meekness, humility, and, and, and lowliness. Jesus Christ was very, very weak, excuse me, very, very meek toward his father. Let's consider Jesus to the father, to his friends, and to his foes. He willingly and cheerfully submitted to his father's entire will. The father's will was his drink, was his food every day. He always did those things that pleased the Father, even as his earthly mission intensified and multiplied beyond what we can imagine, he submitted to the Father's will. Right up to the very end, when he was entering the most agonizing trial of his mission to save you and I, he cried out in human dependence upon his gracious heavenly Father, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. That's meekness. That's humility. It was a very, very, very bitter cup his father put into his hand, but he drank it. The cup that my father has given me, shall I not drink it? He humbly submitted with great meekness and fulfilled his covenant with his father. Paul, writing to Timothy, his beloved son in the faith, points out this, that Christ accomplished in reference to the father's will. In, in 2 Timothy 1.9, we read, according to his, that's God the Father, according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished, 
who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Thank God Jesus was faithful to the mission and was meek and lowly and humble. The highest throne in the universe, the highest throne in all eternity, Jesus comes down. Number two, Jesus was very meek towards his friends that loved and followed him. Jesus patiently bore with the ignorance and pride as he trained up the disciples. Jesus interacted with the disciples so meekly and calmly. He endured patiently with their weakness and infirmities. Even after being with the greatest of teachers, with all the advantages that men could have for the acquaintance with God, yet how weak and defective were they in knowledge, in gifts, and in graces? How forgetful were the disciples? How slow of heart to understand and believe? Many blunders are recorded throughout the Bible about these disciples. They lacked much by way of scholarship, but their hearts were warm towards their Savior. And Jesus did not cast them off nor turn them out of his school, but patiently corrected their mistakes instructed them in their duty. Precept upon precept, line upon line, Jesus taught them as they were able to bear it. As one that considered their frame, he had compassion on the ignorant. Remember also when Peter and James and John were with him in the garden and they slept while he was in agony praying? They seemed to have so little concern about their Savior, yet Jesus meekly speaks to them. Could you not watch with me for one hour? Now this is, this is the Garden of Gethsemane. It's intense. He's getting close to giving up his life. And when they did not have an answer, Jesus basically apologizes for them. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's meekness. That's meekness. Honey, you didn't pay that bill. I told you three times I needed you to pay that bill. Is that meekness? You yell at your child. You did it again. They spilled some milk. Is that meekness? This has to be applied to us in our everyday life. Number three, Jesus was very meek towards his enemies that hated and persecuted him. The whole story of Jesus' earthly life is filled with examples of meekness. While he endured the contradiction of sinners against himself, he had perpetual peace in his heart. Often, he answered brute, rude, and condescending bigots mildly and tenderly. Even though he had the power to thunder and lightning upon them. You remember when some of his disciples would have sent fire from heaven upon those rude people who refused Christ? Jesus was so far from what the disciples wanted. Jesus rebuked them saying, you know not what manner of spirit is in you. Christ desires that his disciples grow into men and women with a meek and merciful temper. His intention is to make us wise and tender toward the comfort of even our worst enemies. Isn't that a little unreasonable? to love your enemies. But that's what he calls us to. That's what he calls us to. 1 Peter 3, 8 reads, having compassion for one another, love his brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. Again, I think of Daniel. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Also, Jesus' meekness towards his enemies appears in his prayers to God for them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus Christ has left us an example. He is our Lord, and we are his servants, his followers. We're following Christ. May God give us the desire and the power to study Christ's meekness and humility and then pray and strive to become like him for the glory of God and for the good of our fellow man. Well, now let's consider our third and final point 
meek, lowly, and humble, exercised. <clears throat> oh, did I get ahead of myself? I did, didn't I? Oh, I think there's more slides. Okay. There, there's, there's a couple more slides in here, but we don't need them. So, I thought long and hard. I'm glad I have 10 minutes. I didn't run out of time. I thought long and hard. What, what could we talk about to make all this, this truth practical and useful in our lives? And I thought about going to James and we could get James chapter three and chapter four is the nitty gritty of everyday living and we can get into that. But I thought if, if I get into James and we look at some of those practical things, I thought it, it, it lays out some ethics that are really important that are good examples that we need to strive for. But I thought, I know for me, when I look at the Ten Commandments, or I look at some ethic that I'm falling short at, like humility or meekness or any, any, any of those good works that we can think of. I know for me, looking inside myself and then looking at the standard, it doesn't do much for me. I mean, we need to do that. We need to know what the standard is. We have to expose ourselves to it. And I think we did that in these first two points, but I want us to think about really the only way we can be successful. There is no other way of getting humility into our hearts and worked out into our lives. And I, I really mean this. There's no other way. And challenge me if you, if you can think of another way, because I'd like to know what it is. There's no other way than looking unto Jesus. Feeding off of his example and feeding off of his grace and his power. Now, how do we get the grace and the power that we need to live like Jesus? Well, it's through the Word and the Holy Spirit. The Word and the Holy Spirit are like two sides of a coin. It's like faith and repentance. You can't separate them. The Word and the Holy Spirit, they go together. We need the Word and we need the Holy Spirit. This is the only way. Paul tells us in his letter to the Philippians, he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross. The Son of God humbled himself. This, this in itself is astonishing. He was made in human likeness. God, the Son, born in a stable, washed and fed by a young mother named Mary. He took the very nature of a servant, God washing feet. Jeffrey Thomas quotes a fellow named Donald McLeod from his work of faith to live by where McLeod ruminates and deliberates of what it must have been like for the angels to witness this astonishing event. Christ, the second person of the Trinity, becoming low and meek. McLeod writes this, what did the angels think of it all? One day they blinked and in astonishment as they saw their great creator in a manger in Bethlehem. They must have found the spectacle incomprehensible. Then, as the days and years moved on, they saw a drama unfold, which must have overloaded their circuits in their computers. One, one day, word came to them that the Lord was in Gethsemane, and one of the angels had to be sent to strengthen him. Hours later, there came even more astonishing news. He was bleeding on the cross of Calvary, that surely was the bottom, they thought, the angels thought. It's the very worst. But no, the next thing was the Father had forsaken him. The God whose whole impulse was to wash away the tears from the eyes of his people would not wash away the tears of his own son. That's how it was from beginning to end of his earthly life. Down and down and down. The tremendous step from throne to stable and then the incredible journey from the stable to the cross and then beyond it to the journey on the cross itself from emulation to dereliction. The angels must have been saying, will this ever end? 
How low is he going to go? How low does he have to go? This he did for you. This he did for me. The Apostle Paul comments on Christ's humility in Philippians 2.8 with three ideas. First, Jesus humbled himself. Jesus entirely and deliberately took each step by himself as if there was a ladder that went down and down and down. And on each step, there was words carved on each step. This is Jeffrey Thomas. He says, miraculous conception was on one step. Birth, stable, infantile weakness, refugee in Egypt, carpenter shop, baptism, wilderness temptations, Satan, constant travel, endless teaching, exhausting healings, betrayal, Gethsemane, flogging, crucifixion, dereliction, abandonment, death, burial. Christ goes down and down. On the cross, he plumbed the depths of the lake of fire when he entered into the cosmic incinerator of sin called Golgotha. We too, Christians, we too must follow Christ, dying to our self-indulgence, dying to our self-sufficiency, and we also must look to serve Look to humble ourselves at work, at home, at school, in the church, in the community. To live for God and to live for the love of God and the love of man. This is true liberty and joy. Say what? Are you kidding me, Paul? You're telling me? That serving God and serving my fellow man and humbling myself and not being self-indulgent is true liberty and true joy? No way. No way. Yes way. Yes way. Now, does that mean you can't buy a BMW? No, it doesn't mean that. There's nowhere in the Bible says you can't buy a BMW. I haven't found that verse. But it does mean that you're low and meek and humble and you're saying, Lord, use me, forgive me. True God glorifying happiness comes when we follow Christ. Second, Paul says that Jesus became obedient to death. The key word here is obedient. So he humbled himself. And that he became obedient. We need to humble ourselves and we need to become obedient. Paul says that Jesus became obedient. Christ's sufferings were not robotic. They weren't automatic. Jesus, with a human nature, obeyed the law of God perfectly and intentionally. It was no calamity. It was not the accident of suffering. You know, some people that misunderstand the gospel, they think Jesus was an like, unaware victim. It was a calamity. It was an accident. It was obedience to God's appointing him to become the Lamb of God who was to take away the sin of the world. It was obedience to all the implications of that. The arrest, the trial, the scourging, the mockery, the unbearable pain. Jesus obeyed at every step. God made him to be sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Not only in heaven when we're glorified, but even down here, we have the Holy Spirit. Our hearts have been quickened. We're no longer in the state of sin. We're in a state of grace. We can obey. The first Adam couldn't even obey the simple command not to take a fruit from the tree in paradise. But the last Adam, Jesus Christ, displayed a range of costly obediences year after year in the wilderness of this world. By the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one man, many were made righteous. So you are righteous. In in, in the courtroom of heaven, you're righteous. And that righteousness that you have should motivate you out of gratitude to humble yourself and be obedient in this life. It was a vicarious, that means in our place. It was a vicarious obedience. Jesus obeyed in our place. 
That obedience of Christ is the believing sinner's righteousness. We are clothed with all the merit and all the discernment of the unfaltering obedience of the Son of God from cradle to the cross. That is what is imputed to us in our account in heaven. God reckons you and I as believers clothed with the merit and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are no longer in bondage to sin. We have freedom and ability to obey. We've been born again. We have new hearts. We have the Holy Spirit's vivifying influence enabling us to obey. We're to obey the will of God by the Spirit. And third and finally, we're told that Jesus became obedient to death. Now, this one is, is a, little, a little bit different. I've got one minute. First of all, Christians will only experience the first death. And the first, the first death has no sting for us. There's no curse. There's no condemnation. The first death is that death where we say, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus killed that death by his death. But that is not the death referred to in Philippians 2. The death in Philippians 2 is the cursed death, the second death. He who knew no sin died as one to whom guilt and shame have been given. He died paying the wages of sin. He died as one made sin, not spared. He died with God's absolute integrity confronting him and there was no mitigation. God doesn't say, see how obedient Jesus is? I'm going to spare him. No, God did not spare him. All that our sin deserves went over his soul into his death. All consciousness of divine favor was taken away from Jesus Christ. Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his atonement whereby he suffered the full fury of God's wrath for your sins and my sins liberates us to be obedient servants, full of faith and gratitude for such a gospel as this. We are to look to Jesus, then we're to look to the interests of others, just as Christ looked to the interests of his people, the church for whom he died. We are to be very concerned with the interest of others. This pattern of love down costly love by christ it's a hurting love a golgotha love a servant kind of love this world is to see that kind of love in the christian community and that will make its own impact on them by grace and providence brothers and sisters and i close with this brothers and sisters like the lord jesus christ we too are to humble ourselves and be obedient james asks you this question who's wise and understanding among you. Any, any, any hands? I'll, I'll answer it for you. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Remember that the wisdom that is from above is first of all pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. If we, by God's help, can grow in meekness, lowliness, and humility, it will revolutionize our relationships in the church, at home, at work, and in the community. Well, I'm going to forego the prayer and dismiss you because we're two and a half minutes over. You're dismissed. You're dismissed.